is verse 12 of Hebrews chapter 10. And there we read, But this man, after he had offered one sacrifice for sins forever, sat down on the right hand of God. This is a most glorious and wonderful verse. And there is tremendous truth in this verse. This man is Christ. And the verse begins with a word of contrast, the word but, making comparison with what has gone before. But this man, Christ, or it could be rendered this priest, because the word man is not in the original. It could be this one, this man, or as the verse before speaks of the priest, I believe that it's right to say, but well, this priest, that's Christ, after he had offered one sacrifice for sins forever, sat down on the right hand of God. And this verse clearly speaks of the superiority of the Lord Jesus Christ. One of the characteristic words of the epistle to the Hebrews is the word better. Right in the very first chapter, we discover that Christ is so much better than the angels. We discover that he was better than Abraham, that in Christ there's a better hope, that he has established a better testament or covenant, that there are better promises connected with the Lord Jesus Christ, that his sacrifice was a better sacrifice, that in heaven, because of Christ, we have a better substance than we have here on this earth, that through Christ we're looking for a better country, we are anticipating a better resurrection, and that God has laid up for us in the future something better. And then we discover in chapter 12 that the blood of Christ speaketh better things than the blood of Abel. So as you go through this epistle, you can underline, even if you don't mark it in your Bible, you can underline the word better. Christ is infinitely better than any man that has ever stood on this earth. Uh, John Blanchard has stated in one of his books that Christ is the one unique person amongst 60 billion. Why the figure 60 billion? Because it's calculated that since the creation, approximately 60 billion people have lived on this earth. One is head and shoulders, not physically, but uh, in spiritual terms, is head and shoulders above all the rest. And that is the Lord Jesus Christ. And that doesn't even do justice to the superiority of the Lord Jesus. There's a contrast between Christ and great men such as Abraham and Moses and Aaron. Christ is far superior. There's a contrast between the sacrifices that were offered in the Old Testament and the once and for all sacrifice of the Lord Jesus Christ. His sacrifice is infinitely superior. And in our text, we have that immediate contrast drawn by the word but. And it is appropriate that at this season of the year, we look at this particular text. And the first thing that we see here is that the contrast in that word but points out the inadequacy of the Old Testament sacrifices. And we find many sacrifices being spoken of. We read of sacrifices year by year continually in verse 1. And when we go down to verse 11, we read, Every priest standeth daily ministry and offering oftentimes the same sacrifices which can never take away sin. So daily sacrifices, your yearly sacrifices, there were sacrifices at the beginning of each month. There were many sacrifices during the seventh month of the year, which was the year uh, in which uh, the Day of Atonement took place. And I sat down with Numbers chapter 28, and I tried to count up how many sacrifices were required each year. On a daily basis, on the, the 
a monthly basis because it was a sacrifice or a number of sacrifices required at the start of each month. And the start of the year and the uh, month of uh, the Day of Atonement. And I counted up 1,274 sacrifices, not counting the uh, two sacrifices that are offered on the Day of Atonement, which aren't, uh, I think, mentioned there. And I worked it out that from Moses to Christ, a period of approximately 1,500 years, uh, just in required sacrifices, leaving aside uh, the sin offerings, the trespass offerings, the peace offerings, the burnt offerings, and the thanksgiving offerings that were offered by the people, and that would have amounted to, uh, to many millions. But over the course of 1,500 years, 1,913,000 animals would have been offered in sacrifice. That's almost 2 million required sacrifices. At the dedication of the temple, Solomon offered 22,000 oxen and 120,000 sheep. That's another 142,000 animals. Add in all the sacrifices of the people to which I have alluded, and you have a veritable sea of blood when you extract the blood from all those animals. And it seems, as we look at the Old Testament, that there is no end of death, no end of shedding of blood. In fact, the problem of dealing with sin, because that's why these sacrifices were offered, the problem of dealing with sin seemed to be insurmountable. We say the word never, uh, sufficient sacrifices offered. And it must have been very frustrating uh, for uh, men and women to look at that situation and to think, when, oh when, will there be a sufficient sacrifice for sin? There we are with our thousands upon thousands of sacrifices running down through the years and yet more and more and more are required Will there ever be a sufficient number of sacrifices? And may I say this? The problem that was faced by the Jews was also one that was recognized by the heathen. Uh, it has been noticed uh, amongst the, the, the different races of people, and I know there aren't different races because I believe there's only one race, the human race, but what are loosely called the different races of people sacrifice seemed to be endemic. People had a consciousness of their need to sacrifice <coughs> to some supreme being. And in some nations, for example the Moabites and the Ammonites that are referred to in the Bible, human sacrifice was practiced. Made of an occasion where the king of Moab in order to appease his God offered his eldest son in sacrifice. You read that in 2 Kings chapter 3, verses 26 and 27. And even some uh, kings of Israel, notably Manasseh, who later got saved, when he was in his unconverted days and in gross rebellion against God, offered his sons in sacrifice to God. So running through the, the consciousness of mankind is this idea of sacrifice to a supreme being. And we might say, why does man feel the need for sacrifice? Yes, we might say God required sacrifice, but why does man, uh, even man who has turned away from the true God, why does he feel his need to offer sacrifice? Surely the answer must come in this way. Man realizes, and of course God has said it as well, man realizes that he is alienated from God. Man recognizes that there is a problem on his side. And he realizes that he needs to appease a higher power. That he is not right with God. In fact, all of those sacrifices and uh, we may concentrate now upon those that are offered in accordance with the word of God, 
all of those sacrifices remind us that man is a sinner, that he has sinned against God. Surely I do not need to enforce that upon you today. You and I are sinners. We have sinned against God. But then if I may think about all those sacrifices in another way, I think of those 1,913,000 sacrifices over a 1,500 year period. I see that the problem is an enormous problem. An enormous problem. Two million sacrifices, say, plus all the sacrifices that individuals brought, that families brought. Add them all together and see that the problem is still not solved. Not enough sacrifices have been offered. And what do you see? You see that man is faced with an enormous problem. Some have tried to solve that problem in other ways. They have tried by good works rather than animal sacrifices. And that's, of course, in the New Testament age. They've tried by good works to solve the problem of sin. The great preacher George Whitfield, after whom our college is named, George Whitfield tried by good works to solve the problem of his sin. And he was most rigorous in fasting, in praying, in reading the scriptures, in performing what he thought were good works. He was most fastidious in seeking to deal with the problem of sin. And last year we were thinking of the 500th anniversary of the Reformation. Martin Luther, before the time of George Whitfield, tried to solve the problem of his sin by entering a monastery, by fasting, uh, by praying, by seeking to read the scriptures, by going out into the community, doing good works, doing everything that he could. He, he almost died. George Whitfield almost uh, died trying to earn salvation, trying to solve the problem of sin. And yet, neither Whitfield nor Luther John Wesley, if I may include him, uh, nor the early Methodists uh, uh, formed their little club at Oxford University. None of them could find that problem resolved. They couldn't deal with it. And here we, we have a clear indication of the enormity of the problem. And of course something else that stands out here. Uh, these sacrifices in the Bible were blood sacrifices. Blood was shed. The blood of animals was poured out upon the ground or poured out over the altar. And uh, there was a very clear indication that there was a need for blood to be shed. But then can we say something? The blood of an animal does not equate to the blood of a man. It doesn't equate to the blood of a man. Yes, blood is shed, and it's, it's giving us a little pointer, indeed a great pointer, to the fact that blood needs to be shed. There's substitution there in the animals, and that, that tells us that, that we need someone else, someone else or something else to deal with the problem that in ourselves we are not able to put away our sins. Uh, we may fast. We may pray, we may read, we may do good works, we may turn over a new leaf, but it's still not enough. It won't do, it won't work. After John Bunyan was married, uh, he realized that his father-in-law, his wife's father, was a very godly man, and he tried to live up to that standard, but he couldn't do it. And you become miserable. You become wretched. You try harder and harder to deal with the problem, but you find yourself a complete and utter failure. You see, not only were these sacrifices insufficient, they were worse than that. 
they were inadequate. They were inadequate. That's very clearly stated for us. Because uh, we see it in these verses. In verse 11 it says, Every priest standeth daily, ministering and offering oftentimes the same sacrifice, and notice these words, which can never take away sins. Can never do it. If those sacrifices were to continue throughout eternity, they could never take away our sins. The same statement is made in essence in verse 4. It says, it is not possible. It says, not only can they never take away sins, but it is not possible that the blood of bulls and of goats should take away sins. So when they point to the solution, they do not actually provide the solution. So there is no solution in the blood of animals. Yes, they're appointed by God to show us that we're sinners. To show us the enormity of the problem of our sins. Sinning against God is not small. It's not a little thing. You discover that one sin plunged the whole human race into the judgment of God. Brought the whole human race down and marked man out as a transgressor. One sin. Thomas Watson speaks of uh, the rankness of a poison, one drop of which could poison an ocean. And he contrasts that and compares it with one sin that could destroy and condemn the whole human race unless that sin were dealt with through the Lord Jesus Christ. Sin's not a small thing. People laugh at sin. The Bible says fools mock at sin. They think it's a joke. They think it's fun. But sin is not. And you discover that when the Holy Spirit of God begins to deal with your heart. That's why in a time of revival, men and women are so greatly disturbed. We love to talk about the 1859 revival. We love to talk about the Six Mile Water Revival of the 17th century. And we love to talk about the times under Nicholson and Dr. Paisley in the 60s. We love to hear of uh, tremendous movements of the Spirit of God. But one thing that we need to remember is this. During those mighty movements of God, men and women came under tremendous conviction of sin. They were really troubled about their sins. They were so disturbed that many times they cried out. And, and that's in line with the scriptures. Because if you read in Acts chapter 2, as Peter preached, and it was a very straightforward message that he preached. It wasn't complicated. He quoted from the Old Testament scriptures. He showed that the Jews had made not just a tragic mistake, in rejecting their Messiah, but they, they have committed an enormous crime. And as he concludes his message, he says, God has made that same Jesus, both Lord and Christ, and in the original, and finishes this way, whom ye crucified. He, he hits them. We might say, he hits them where it hurts the most. After showing that Christ is the Messiah, that he had died, that he had risen again, that he was at the right hand of God, that he was the appointed Savior, the only Savior, he said, who be crucified? You've crucified him. And by the Jews were smitten. Thousands of them were smitten in heart. And they cried out in despair, men and brethren, what shall we do? The enormity of sin was now appreciated. Sin was not a light thing. No longer were they saying, his blood be on us and on our children. No longer were they saying, away with him, let him be crucified. They were saying, men and brethren, what shall we do? Is there any hope? Is there any possibility of ever being saved? So, as you think about those sacrifices of the Old Testament age, 
They point in the right direction, but they don't deal with the problem. They were not appointed to deal with the problem. They were appointed to show us our alienation from God, to show us the enormity of the problem that we face in our sins, to show us that we cannot save ourselves, that the blood of bulls and goats cannot wash away our sins, that the sacrifices of the priests can never, never take away our sins. But they prepare us. They prepare us for the solution. We're at the season of the year where we've just been thinking about our Saviour's crucifixion. Two days ago, we have the day called, maybe it's not the right word for it, but we talk about Good Friday. It was a very dark day in the history of the world when the Lord Jesus Christ had to die on Calvary's cross for sinners. But notice what it says here in our verse. And this is my second and indeed my last point. And that is, we see here the absolute su sufficiency of the work of the Lord Jesus Christ. Ha having in the early part of this chapter shown his readers that there's no possibility of the sacrifices of the Old Testament dealing with the problem of sin, the apostle says in verse 12, but... But, here's the difference, but this man, or but this priest, after he had offered one sacrifice for sins forever, sat down on the right hand of God. Now that's an enormous claim. That's an enormous claim. You, you've, you've, say, the stated sacrifices, two million of them that have been offered, and collectively they haven't been able to deal with the problem of sin. And now the apostle says, but this man, well, just one person, but this priest, in, in contradistinction to uh, all the priests of uh, the Levitical line, from Aaron right down, this one priest, this one man, after he offered one sacrifice for sins forever, sat down on the right hand of God. That's a staggering claim I say to you again. And I remember, and it's 52 years ago, I heard Pastor Willie Bowen preach. The only time I ever heard him, it was in February 1966. A friend brought me to Great Victoria Street Baptist Church. And Pastor Willie Bowen was preaching. The only time I ever heard him. And actually, I went from that to the Ulster Hall to hear Dr. Paisley. I think that was the first time I heard him. Well, he spoke about the blood of Christ being the solution to man's sin. And I was unsealed. And after I had been to that meeting, my friend was witnessing to me. And I could not, and I expressed this to him, I could not see how the blood of one person could deal with the sins of so many people. I could not see it. I could not see it. But then I didn't fully realize who the person was. Yes, I knew he was Jesus Christ. Yes, I knew he was the Son of God. But I didn't fully appreciate how glorious and amazing the Lord Jesus Christ is in his person. <coughs> That's indeed where, where the word better comes in. <coughs> better than Abraham, better than Moses, better than Aaron. He's better than the angels. <coughs> but he's more than that. He's more than better, if I can so express myself. He's more than better than angels. We discover in the first chapter of this book that uh, he created the word, that he upholds all things by the word of his power, that he is the express image of the Father's person. He is exactly like God because he is God. 
John chapter 1 and verse 3 says, All things were made by him, and without him was not anything made that was made. I love that statement, and I often refer to it in Genesis chapter 1. It says there, He made the stars also. It says, He made the sun to rule by day, and the moon to rule by night, the greater and lesser lights as they're called. And it mentions all his other work of creation. And then it throws in what seems like an incidental detail. Just a matter of fact statement. He made the stars also. It used to be thought, and a man called Ptolemy uh, thought he had cracked it, used to be thought that the number of stars could be counted. And Ptolemy counted around 1,100 stars. I couldn't do that. But I love looking up at the stars. And then we discovered with telescopes that there were far more and could be seen with the naked eye. And it is reckoned that there are galaxies of billions of galaxies way beyond the range of our most powerful telescopes. So there are billions and billions and trillions and probably quadrillions of stars. The galaxy is immense. And yet the Bible says, He made the stars also. Just spoke. Just spoke. So the person we're talking about is no ordinary person. He is of infinite power. He is of infinite worth. And he proved his greatness when he was here on the earth. The miracles were, were really signposts, as John chapter 20, verses 30 and 31 tell us. The miracles were signposts, signs, that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God. They point that out to us. And men who were on the earth in the time of Christ, and we who read of these miracles in the Bible, we are being given a signpost, and it points to Christ and says, this is the Son of God. This is God the Son. This is one who is equally God with the Father. He is almighty. He is eternal. He is omniscient. He knows everything. He is omnipresent. He's everywhere present. No ordinary person. The Lord Jesus Christ. He is far, far superior. Far superior to any other man. He is that one unique individual amongst the 60 billion who have lived on this earth. The Lord Jesus Christ stands supreme above all men. And there's one miracle that, that really brings it home to you. Remember when the disciples were up in the boat. And you have a beautiful picture there of the two natures of Christ. He became flesh and dwelt amongst us. The one who made all things became flesh, dwelt amongst us. Well, in that boat, you see the God man. As man, he's weary. And he lays his head down and he falls fast asleep. While he's sleeping, a violent storm erupts on the uh, Sea of Galilee. And the disciples try to uh, bail out the water, try to rescue the situation and discover that they are defeated and the boat is filling up and it's just about to, to reach that level where it will go down onto the water. And they came to Christ and they shook him up and said, Master, Master, carest thou not that we perish? And Christ stood up calmly, unruffled in that boat. And he says, why are ye so fearful? Why are you so scared? Oh, ye have little faith. And then he did something that shows his divine power. He rebuked the wind and the sea. And he said, peace, be still. Stop. Stop it. And immediately, immediately, there was a great calm. And the disciples looked at one another in wondering amazement. And they said, 
What manner of man is this? What kind of a man is this? That even the wind and the sea obey him. Yeah, we know what kind of man he is. He's God. A man. Charles Wesley said, Veiled in flesh, the Godhead seen. Hail the incarnate deity. That's deity in flesh. Pleased as man with men to dwell. Jesus our Emmanuel. Jesus our God with us. The Lord Jesus Christ is utterly unique. So when it says this man or this priest, it's no ordinary person that is spoken of. And it says he had offered one sacrifice for sins forever. He sat down on the right hand of God. He took the place of sinners. He identified with us. The blood that was in his veins was untainted blood. Untainted by one sin. Not one sin. Because if there had been one sin in the life of Christ, his blood would have been tainted blood. But the Bible speaks of his precious blood being more valuable than silver or gold. Corruptible things such as silver or gold. His blood is untainted blood. And interestingly, in Acts chapter 20 uh, and verse 28, uh, so closely identified uh, are, are the two natures of Christ uh, that uh, we discover the Apostle Paul saying, Take heed to the elders of Ephesus. He says, Take heed therefore unto you, uh, unto yourselves, unto all the flock over the which the Holy Ghost hath made you overseers, uh, to feed the church of God, which he, and the immediate uh, word before the word he, is God, which he hath purchased with his own blood. It almost seems to suggest the blood of God. Now we know there's no blood in God. But Jesus Christ is God and man. The blood he shed is the blood of the one who is both God and man. That makes it the most precious blood. It makes it absolutely unique blood. It is very powerful blood. The hymn writer said, What can wash away my sin? And the answer, Nothing but the blood of Jesus. What can make me whole again? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. A hymn writer put it this way in. Uh, I just want to read it, uh, a verse uh, of the hymns, just in case you're looking for it. It's hymn number 96. And hymn 96, we read these words. Not all the blood of beasts on Jewish altars slain could give the guilty conscience peace or wash away the stain. But Christ, the heavenly Lamb, takes all our sins away. A sacrifice of nobler name and richer blood than they. Yes, it's the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ alone that can deal with the problem of sin. And may I say something more here? And I know my time is just about gone. This sacrifice is the greatest sacrifice that God could possibly have given. Remember how in the Garden of Gethsemane Christ prayed, Father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. That if it's possible, let this cup pass from me. And his sweat fell to the ground as great drops of blood, or as it might have been rendered, great clots of blood. I understand it, that when a person sweats blood, that person has experienced almost unbelievable anguish. Almost unbelievable anguish. The heart of Christ. The heart of Christ was broken. And he's going through unimaginable horrors in the Garden of Gethsemane. He says, if it's possible, if it's possible. Nevertheless, he doesn't retreat from it. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as thou wilt, sweating great drops of blood. An angel came to strengthen him. And I think I said at the prayer meeting on Tuesday night, the only way I can see of that as having taken place is by a word of comfort coming from the throne of God. The Father coming and giving a message to Christ through his angel to strengthen him 
in what appears a well nigh impossible situation. On the cross he cried out, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? And something more here. Christ knew in eternity what he would pass through. He knew. He never, he never put back. He knew in eternity what was required. You imagine what it would be like if you were told that in ten days' time you are going to be tortured to death. You'd lose your mind today. If we're going to suffer, we'd rather not know in advance. Christ knew in eternity past what he would have to do, what he would have to suffer, the price he would have to pay. He's described in Revelation 13 and 8 as the lamb slain from the foundation of the world. Before this world was created, Christ knew that he would have to come, that he would have to die, that he'd have to suffer indescribable agony and anguish. So this is the greatest sacrifice. And it was absolutely necessary. I've heard it said that God could have, theoretically, could have just hardened man's sin without the atonement, without the work of the cross. I say to you that uh, that is utterly wrong. Utterly wrong. The hymn writer said, of Solomon said, there was no other way a God of love could find to reconcile the world and save a lost mankind. And uh, the uh, last line of the verse says, there was no other way but Calvary. No other way but the cross. And the sacrifice of Christ was absolutely sufficient. Notice how it's put in our text. This man after he offered one sacrifice for sins forever. Or uh, some have put it in the interlinears in perpetuity. That means going on, going on and on and on and on forever in perpetuity. It lasts forever. How glorious it is. That's why Christ could say, it is finished. That's why the veil of the temple was rent in two from top to bottom. And that's why... <coughs> On the third day, he rose again from the dead. The hymn writer said, Lo, in the grave he would lay, Jesus my Saviour. Waiting the coming day, Jesus my Lord. Then death cannot keep its prey, Jesus my Saviour. He tore the bars away, Jesus my Lord. Up from the grave he arose. With a mighty triumph for his foes. He arose a victor from the dark domain. And he lives forever with the saints to reign. He arose. He arose. Hallelujah. Christ arose. That's what we're remembering today. That's what we're celebrating today. The Lord Jesus Christ is risen. He has paid the price. And he's in the place of honor. The right hand of God. Is the place of honor. That means that. Sin has been put away. Because if there's any sin left that Christ took upon himself, if there's any sin left, he'd not be in that place of honor, the right hand of the Father. He'd be rejected. But he sat down. That's what our text is. He sat down on the right hand of God. What a Savior. Is your trust in him? You're trusting him. Are you trying to deal with uh, an insoluble problem? An impossible problem, trying with your good works to get to heaven, trying by coming to church, even this church, to get to heaven. That's not the way of salvation. Jesus said, Come on to me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. You're not coming to a mere man, you're coming to the Almighty, you're coming to the eternal Son of God, you're coming to the only Savior. The Son of God. Oh, why uh, try to save yourself when it's impossible? Why not come to the only one who can save you? A Christian. Keep looking to Christ. You, you don't begin with Christ and then uh, work your way through in the flesh. You need him day by day. Be thankful. Surely, surely we ought to be grateful to the Lord. We ought to rejoice that the Lord is risen, that he's our friend, that he's our saviour. And that should motivate us to live the Christian life to the full. 
The Apostle Paul put it this way in Romans chapter 12. I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that ye present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. Be not conformed to this word, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that ye may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. There's no room for being half-hearted. God requires us to make a full surrender of our hearts and our lives to him. Let's bow together in prayer.